Yes, it's the welcome to the last webinar before our summer break. We had many awesome guests the last few months and um, in autumn we will continue with our scientific talks, but today we wanted to have light and breezy, like a summer breeze. And we invite you to let go of the perfectionism and um, the ideas of how to approach as an adult or as an grown up of nature, we really invite you to think of your um, childhood and, and sparkle your curiosity and get into interaction with us and bring nature in, maybe in a more intense way back in your life over the next few weeks. Uh, we really invite you to share um, and inter you can e easily interrupt us. You can unmute yourself. You can write in the chat, whatever you prefer. This is part of the biomimicry thinking. We want to share nature connection and the, the wisdom that lays in nature with um, so many people, many people as possible. And so this is one uh, session to really appreciate uh, nature's wisdom and look at a different um, angle at it, maybe. So we prepared a presentation, but we will not stick to it. Um, we just started um, the presentation um, with the five senses. But first of all, um, I might introduce Michaela. Oh, no, I'm too early. No, I'm jumping no, 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 jump now. Then the other, then we do that one. Then another side, then the next side. Yeah. There we go. So Michaela M, she is my partner from Biomimicry Switzerland. Uh, she has over uh, 20 years uh, experience in corporate communication and she is an extensive practitioner in corporate training, coaching and facilitation. And she founded her company Eclosion in 2004. She recently gained a B Corp certification, which is very rare when you are um, small or medium-sized company and Swiss triple impact certifications. And I'm really glad to have her um, and to have these conversations with her because uh, biomimicry is still a niche. And I'm glad to have um, like-minded people around me. And that's the reason, she's the reason why I joined Biomimicry Switzerland. Yes, yeah, so here's my partner in crime, Sonia donauer Dums. Uh, of course, Biomimicry Switzerland is more than just Switzerland since uh, Sonia is sitting right now in Vienna, but it is also part of the bioregion of the Alps. So we welcome everybody uh, from everywhere and uh, have a focus on alpine um, species and ecosystems. So I'm very happy to have uh, Sonia with me. Uh, Sonia is a business consultant and she's also a certified biomimicry practitioner. And um, she also, like me, would like to bring biomimicry to organizations and to coaching in businesses. So I'm very happy to have her with me. And she founded Entophila in 2021. So a new baby, a one-year-old baby. And uh, you're also trying to apply for a bio, uh, B Corp. Uh, and it seems to be a little bit more complicated in Austria than in Switzerland. So. I hope you join us in the B movement uh, very soon. So thanks for being here. And today we're the ones holding the space, but you're all invited to participate and please share and exchange with us your uh, conceptions of nature and how you reconnect uh, with your senses or also in other ways, maybe through writing prompts, for example. So welcome everybody. Sonia, should we I go forward or back? <laughs> um, one back and one then back. Uh, yeah, one back. So we were thinking of um, shifting the baseline a bit with this um, idea of bringing nature back to us in our lives. Imagine a world around you where you cannot hear the birds singing or feel the wind in your hair, see the bright colors of flowers or smell the air after a warm summer rain. It will feel very empty. More and more people out there do not have that close relationship to nature. And that is the reason why we focus on reconnecting it or deepen it in a playful way and bond again with nature today. And this brings us to the awakening of our five senses to nature. And uh, we could start with the first one, which, I, which is sight. Sight. So sight is the sense that humans use the most. It's not the most important one, but it's the one we rely on when we are not children anymore. 
And I think that's why we decided to start with the sense of sight. And maybe we can have a little round of what do you do uh, with your sight sense to reconnect to nature? I'm sure Emily, you returning champion of this uh, webinar, have lots of ideas about colors and patterns and things. Do, how do you connect to nature through the sense of sight? Um, Michaela, I connect every day through the sense of sight, um, through the work that I do as a florist. Um, I work with nature all the time. Um, I observe the season that's around the property that I work and I try and bring what I see that's happening outside in um, the surrounding areas. I live, I work at, a, a, at the hotel, which is in a very, very um, green area. It's one of the oldest and the biggest urban um, forests in the world. So I look at what's happening outside and try and bring that inside. And then obviously I work with color and form and patterns that present to me when I work with flowers. Fantastic. H have you noticed, uh, we talked about this during, uh, when you presented your webinar, um, how bringing nature insight in the, the sense of sight uh, brings more joy to the guests in, in, in the hotel. Uh, is it tangible? Can you give us maybe a couple anecdotes about that? You know, I, I sense it so strongly. Uh, you know, I will go down a corridor that's got no flowers in it. And I use a lot of dried flowers. And you would think that dried flowers or fresh flowers would actually have a very different experience. But if I go down a, a dark corridor or an underground corridor where the, where the rooms are lower, um, it is such a different experience to look at that corridor that was empty and then look at it again when there's flowers there. It is such a different experience. I mean, I honestly, it, it changes the whole experience. Um, I, I see it in when we do changeovers, you know, because I do long-term flowers in either plant form or dried sculptures. And when we change the design, the response of the people that work in the, that work in that, um, you know, like for instance, the reception, they're tired of seeing the same design for a month, but they have such a response to it when it is changed. And I think that also, and also guest, guest experience, you know, when they walk past something and they see, they, they comment on what they're seeing. So it's, um, it's an experience for them as well. It's very much a connection to nature. Um, I feel that um, without the flowers, the space is almost dead. You know, it feels like it's lifeless. And then you just put some flowers in a, in a space and it completely changes the atmosphere. Fantastic. I could see Amiris uh, nodding. Uh, do you have any experiences with flowers or decoration or natural patterns that you see around you? Well, uh, I always have flowers, fresh flowers in my house. Yeah, and I tell myself, uh, this is your present. Like someone gave you um, something just for joy. Uh, I also live uh, far away from the city center. Uh, so I still have some, uh, some uh, trees around and birds and, and everything else. And every single, yeah, uh, time I have, I, I look at the sunset, which is in front of my porch here on the balcony, a porch not, but the balcony. And um, this is my, my main TV. I don't like TV, so I go there and watch the sunset. It's funny that you take out the sun and the sunset, uh, because I, I joined the society, which is 
I enjoin you to join too. It's the Cloud Appreciation Society, uh, uh, which has been founded by a Brit. Who else than Brits for that? Uh, that wrote a book about clouds and cloud patterns and what you see in clouds and the whole mythology of clouds. And I even got a little sticker on my car that says, may break at any time for interesting cloud formations. So check out the Cloud Appreciation Society. They have a great uh, social media feed and people can add on their, their clouds and cloud patterns. And I think, uh, of course, the sky is extremely important. Um, here in Switzerland, where I live, I'm in the Alps, so I'm blessed with lots of sun. But then when I used to live in Geneva, being in the fog from November to March, uh, and seeing no cloud patterns, no sun, really takes a toll on people's mood. And um, I, I usually forget now that my clients are under the blanket. And I'm like very joyful and, and they're very depressed in February. So I can really sense the, the difference of, of perspective if you're above or below the clouds. So yeah, may, maybe I, I continue with this change of perspective. Um, lately, I discovered um, an idea, which is the view from above. Uh, if you climb to a mountain or you climb, every city has a highest building where you look at, at things from the top, you will see patterns and interactions that you're not aware of when you're at ground level. So maybe we should also try to, you know, maybe lower ourselves and look, I saw you had a cat, uh, Amaris. Uh, imagine what the cat is seeing uh, while, while it walks around uh, your flat or the garden or the balcony. Uh, imagine what birds see, try to zoom yourself into another perspective. And with the sense of sight, you can really imagine what you can see from afar, what you can see close, and this succession of, of perspectives. And I think it's a very interesting exercise uh, to do um, in order to have a more complete understanding of what surrounds us. Uh, when I started, uh, I'm, a, I'm a private pilot. When I started flying, all of a sudden you realize how close things are. Uh, especially in a country where there's lots of mountains where, you know, you, you take time and you say, oh, I'm driving to Zurich. That's three hours. And you only see highway. And all of a sudden you fly at low altitude over the Alps and you're like, hey, that's really close. And you can really see, you know, that the river's flowing and the, the connections between the nodes for human communication, highways, trains, cable cars. And then you see the, the natural patterns the colors, the mineral, the vegetal. So I think it's a, it's a beautiful way of uh, apprehending uh, things uh, around us. I see Sophie, Sophie, hello. You have your hand up. Yes, hello. Um, I want to direct on that as well, because um, uh, thanks to you, we are both in, in the Alps. We know each other since quite a while. And thanks to you, you gave me actually a change of perspective because even though I live in the, in the mountains and I have this beautiful nature around me, um, having someone that shows you as well to see different with your eyes does make a huge difference. Um, for example, we're just um, uh, being on the sea uh, a week ago where um, I have been many times on the sea. I have been many times seeing the sea, the sand and everything, but it's the first time I'm actually looking at these little crabs, these very little shells that are moving on their own. And I was like a little child looking at them and saying, hi, this is the first time in my life I'm seeing them, um, getting a little bit up, watching if there's someone around and starting walking very quickly because we are so many predators around. And I mean, I'm sure they've always been there, uh, but it's the first time that I, I saw them. And it's, I believe it's since um, I have people like you around showing me like, if you change your perspective, if you look differently, if you open your eyes, um, on small details that you never watched before. Actually, the world is amazing. <laughs> uh, I'm sure this sounds like totally natural to you, but for me, every day is like now becoming more exciting because I'm seeing small details um, that it, it didn't, my eyes didn't touch them before because my 
brain maybe was not alert to those details. So yeah, I just wanted to share this about this change of perspective because for me it's as well, because some person gave me the change of perspective. And I think that's as well uh, quite an interesting point of view. Thanks very much, Sophie. Uh, this, this really resonates with last month's uh, webinar uh, with uh, Chris Montero that uh, walked us through uh, some sketching uh, and observing nature. And I wrote down the quote he opened with, which is, we see more because we understand more of what we are seeing. And I, I think totally agree. It's like the chicken and the egg, you know? <laughs> Well, we all know the egg came first, but uh, <laughs> the more you see, the more you understand, and the more you understand, the more you see. And once you have seen small things and pay attention to them, you cannot unsee them, and you want to understand. Uh, I think it, it goes back to something very childish in, in us, you know, discovering and uh, apprehending new things. So yeah, that really reminded me of what Chris was saying. Thanks very much for your perspective, Sophie. How about you, uh, Sonia? We haven't asked you what you do. It's change of perspective. Um, yeah, as you all know, I live in Vienna, but um, I'm originally from Upper Austria. Um, my husband is from Salzburg, so we go often. We sometimes have a second home there, and we go often on weekends. Um, out in nature and go there. And we used to climb mountains a lot because um, we had the natural feeling that you, we wanted to take a view from above. And it helped us having after an exhausting week uh, while working in a city, um, getting a new perspective on things and feeling a little bit more like a tiny part of a big universe and so that the problems um, went away. We didn't have any problems anymore. When we're on top on the hill, it's just beautiful seeing different a different perspective of the hometown or whatever they're looking in the clouds. You feel tiny, but uh, not lonely, very connected to nature. And um, I needed at least once a month to leave the city and just go everywhere, anywhere, with uh, no city around me and with um, lots of nature around me. And this might, might bring us to the next point because it's the hearing I so desperately miss Shall I when I'm on? on the countryside. The hearing is totally different. When you live in a city, there is so much sound everywhere. Last week, I went to a crazy conference. I used to laugh a lot and back in 2018. And now I was totally overwhelmed by all these sounds in the background and music and DJs going on while having good conversations and good lectures. So I feel we are sometimes a bit overwhelmed by all these uh, sounds around us. And the city is hard to cope with it. So I really like having nothing around me sometimes or concentrate on the natural sounds. My sitting spot is in my backyard and I always listening to the birds. And sometimes it's uh, that I close my eyes and I try to make out where the birds are sitting and, and to whom they are chatting. And um, it's very hard to to get the direction and the distance right. It's, it's a good exercise, but it's really hard. Sometimes I know, but I can't believe it. And this brings me to the next point. I think it might help to create a sound map. This, uh, this could be an interesting exercise over the summer, maybe with the kids to, to do some recording and create a sound map and try to mix these sounds. I have that on my list as well, because uh, I've listened to a, a, a show on the radio where a teacher was taking uh, kids outside and they had to like a draw a sound map of what was going on around them. And they were in a city, but in a park, so they could have, you know, natural sounds and non-natural sounds. And 
and they drew, they, they like sketched it out. Like here is more natural, here is louder. And, and, and they had like zones where you could hear the birds, zones where you can't. And I think that's, that's an exercise I want to do uh, definitely this summer, maybe just in my garden. What do I hear mm -hmm. where I am? Uh, and be attentive to sound uh, in a more conscious way, because I have all, I have my cat meowing right now, but I, ha I have all these birds uh, in, in my, in my garden and you can see the succession. You can hear the succession in the morning. You don't have the same birds as at nine, when I drink my tea, it's another bird and they reply to other birds and then they move to my neighbor's yard and then they come back. They've got their whole, you know, pattern uh, during the day. Uh, but making a sound map and maybe even a night sound map. Mm -hmm. What is going on at night when you think everything's sleeping? Uh, that, that's going to be on my list for, for, for this, this summer. Uh, just to go back to the seeing, stargazing, of course. Mm. you know or a combination of both stargazing yes. and hearing <laughs> yeah. or if i can see your your hand up yes hi um i live in a city and i'm surrounded by castles and daffodils and leeks and the country city used to be full of fields but over time it's evolved so there's all car parks shopping centers offices however we have the nearby valleys and then my perspectives, um, there is a difference between the air and the ground, and especially colours. Everything in the air tends to be blue, which is the clouds. Everything around on the ground tends to be green. The leaves, the hedges, the trees, chirping birds, nestling. I even think they're green, because as they're hidden in the trees, which are green, you can't really see them, can you? Unless they fly out. And then you think, oh, look, it's a pigeon, a pair of doves cooing, and it's very beautiful. I spend a lot of time in the garden. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Well, any other experiences with sounds that that you can give us tips about that we can put on our to do list for the summer? My to do list is growing. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I, I do sometimes um, when I'm in my garden, try to count the amount of birds around me. Um, I think it's an interesting exercise to do just to close your eyes and to try to figure out how many birds you have around because everyone is chirping differently and try to figure out, okay, how many can I figure out just by listening to them? Um, it's quite an interesting exercise to do because you need quite a lot of um, concentration because after six or seven, you don't remember if you already counted the next one that you hear or not. And I think it, it relies a bit on, on your mapping that you were saying before, uh, that is, is, if you want to do such a sound map, you need first of all to be able to hear them all and remember which one did you already map, did you already draw on your map. And um, yeah, I, I like to do this because it's really relaxing and um, it's a sort of meditation that I think is, is, is really, really helpful on your daily stressing life so yeah i just wanted to share that but i think it's a nice exercise to do it's on my list now just mapping but i don't know if it's a meditation or more of a stressor to me i'm getting it right how many birds are in my garden <laughs> but i will see i, I counted i counted i think 12 or 13 on one day but uh, I'm sure if I will do this exercise in the morning or lunchtime or evening, as Michaela said before, it must be different birds. It, it, it would be interesting to do that, that exercise as well, to know if it's the same ones, uh, if there's the same amount. I will mm -hmm. put that on my do-do list. <laughs> <laughs> Harf, uh, you want to say something? Yeah, I liked what the lady said about counting the different sounds of birds. I've tried to do it. And I found it overwhelming as a sensory exercise because I got confused. And then it dawned on me to my right, we've got um, our neighbors have a row of trees and there's always pigeons flying out of them. To my left, we used to have a tree and um, the neighbor cut it down. But still, I've seen robins and sparrows fly out. So when I can't decipher the sounds and they fly past and I'm like, good God, I know what that is now. And then, and then I've got an apple tree in front of me and then you get birds flying out of that. But then to add to this confusion, I've got a neighbor who breeds pigeons. 
So on the roof now, in front of me, I'm looking at the blue sky and I can see a roof and all the rows of pigeons are sitting there. So I'm looking at these family of pigeons, counting them every day. How many are going to come out today? And then you see little <laughs> sparrows and robins fly out. I love birds. I love nature. Nature is so contemporary as a writing form now. So I just love exploring that aspect. But I do find it confusing, but with practice, you do get more confident. I believe you can, on your phone, get an app which can decipher... And I've started using it yesterday. I was shocked. We had a tree in our back garden. We had a chop down and an owl was nestling in there. My father didn't like the owl nestling in there. And so how can we do that? I have no idea where they went. So today I'm sitting in the front of my house and I'm put on the bird app machine and they picked up two bird owls. I got so emotional. I started crying. I thought, good God, it didn't go far, did it? And we were from the back of the house where the tree was chopped down. So the front of the house. And I just got overwhelmed. The beauty of nature. And the nesting, nestling, you hear these sounds, you can't see them. During lockdown, COVID, we're stuck indoors. The only fresh air we had was out of our windows and our back gardens. So I love that aspect. And the first thing you wake up to is chirping birds. You know, early morning, early morning before the rubbish truck goes park, people go walking, taking their children to school. It's so beautiful. The air is so crisp and clear. And that time just after dawn, and then again at dusk when the soft, soft sky dies down, or you see the twinkling stars then, and the creature, animals, birds return to the habitats. I've seen a slug one night, I was sitting in the back and it's too hot inside, and I saw a slug on the decking board, and it left a long trail. And I thought, what is that shimmering in the night sky against a moon background? And it's just so beautiful. And um, yeah, I just love nature, basically. That's why I attended this workshop. So thank you for these prompts. and um questions sure you're thank welcome you so much. thank you for sharing yeah i went on a bit sorry <laughs> that's absolutely perfect <laughs> we're here for that <laughs> okay sorry thank you sonia should we move to the next uh item on our list which mm -hmm. is touch that's a, a trickier one maybe you want to introduce it yeah, touch, um, it's a very sens sensitive um, um, sense. Um, and uh, we were thinking of, of what we want to offer to you, what you might not have done before. And um, we were thinking of, of touching different textures uh, of plants, but uh, not that the plants you usually touch, but maybe different parts of the plant, not only the leaves, but al also the tree parks or, um, or grab a bit in the, in the soil and, and feel also the temperature or the wetness or the moisture of, of this. And uh, maybe you want to close your eyes while this um, this um, practice or have someone with you with a blindfold and uh, let you feel these things. Um, sometimes uh, it's also very interesting to, to have the direct um, comparison or connection to feel the flow of water on your hand or feel the flow of air on your skin and Maybe this is a good exercise to do it with uh, with another person to have help and um, to have to do this with a blindfold. Um, I think we are more used to touch animals or um, or other humans, but I um, I suppose we are not so often touching plants or leaves or, or barks. This might be a completely different um, experience. What do you think, Michaela? Or I have a solution for all of this is walk barefoot. Yeah. You, barefoot. you, you touch different textures. You've got things that sting you. You've got little stones. You can feel the temperature. I love going outside every day, three minutes uh just barefoot winter or summer and it's cold and and you feel you know the tingling and then you go back in and you get the, the release of uh, of the blood and uh in summer uh, i have stones and they get very hot but i still try to to walk barefoot to to kind of sense my environment i think we get lots of uh information from touching 
but we don't only touch with our hands we also touch with our body we we sit on a bench or we sit in the grass and and you get all these textures and moisture and and sometimes it's nice and sometimes it's not <laughs> and sometimes you touch a plant you should not have touched uh, and i think it's it, it's quite amazing to to do it consciously walk barefoot for a few minutes and just feel what you 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 feel uh, i know here in in switzerland i guess in austria they do that too they have paths where you can walk barefoot that are organized by you know associations or wandering uh, uh, or tourist office and they, they remove whatever is would be dangerous. And then you go through streams and you climb on rocks and then you've got pine cones. Pine cones are very painful. Uh, and, and bees are the worst, <laughs> especially for me who's allergic. Every once in a while you step on something you don't want to step on. But I think it's, it, it's pretty amazing everything you can sense through your feet. Maybe we could think of Adam, uh, Adam tools to touch not only our hands or the feet is there a, uh, is there another possibility to interact with touching do you have another idea what this could be another part of your body Amiris well I travel a lot uh, inside Brazil uh, I'm really curious about this big country I've, I've been living uh, out of the country for a while, and I decided to know, um, to learn this, the differences in the biomas. And one of the thing is, uh, you can go to the beach and, and uh, you will feel uh, one part of the, the, the ocean very cold. And when you are in another part of the country, the, the ocean is very, I, I would say, uh, hot because the, the water, uh, it, it, it's not uh, that, that cold. I don't know. And, um, uh, I, and I recently went to the Amazonian region and uh, you have a different kind of sand because it's a, the, the sand from the river uh, it, it's not it's not something mud, muddy. It's uh, sand, me, really white one, and it was pretty amazing because it's quite different from the sand from the ocean. Mm -hmm. It was really a learning experience. <laughs> yeah, I, I like also, uh, you know, when you were saying, uh, can we touch with other parts of our body? Of course, when you go into water. Uh, uh, very clearly, uh, last week we were in the sea with Sophie, and there were like currents, cold currents, warm currents. Uh, you could you could also feel the viscosity uh, when it's very salty. It was the Red Sea, so it was very viscous. And then you go back to the pool, which was very chlorinated, and that was very harsh. Uh, even the water has has texture, uh, and I think uh, when when you when you put your you immerse yourself you get a very very complete experience of what's going on around you plus you feel the little fish at the bottom that suck on your feet mm. <laughs> <laughs> they used to scare me when i was a child now i know they're harmless <laughs> sophie Yeah, uh, about parts. Um, I I like to, you know that Michaela, but I like to go in in the forest uh, to hug trees, to lie down in the grass. And uh, after at the beginning, the first time you do that, it's like okay, it's it's a bit harsh. It's a tree, and and eventually, when you you get yourself on it, um, not really thinking, and you really hug, you realize that it's actually soft on your skin, on the cheeks, on your arms. There are not any any part that are rough. So I, I, that's something that I discovered with the time that actually, even when we touch with other parts of the body, like the cheek or the, the in, inner part of the arms, it's, things can be really soft, even though you think they are not. Like, as I say, the tree or so, sometimes as well, the grass, as you say, when you're barefoot, there are things in the grass you actually don't want to walk in. Um, but when you just 
don't think of it and lie down on it. Um, everything is quite um, agreeable. It's, it's really, um, you like it, you know, it's, it's, it's soft on the skin. And even if you touch something, as you say, that are a bit irritating, it lasts a few seconds afterwards, you already forget of it. So yeah, this, this, this um, interaction is, is kind of interesting. And I like to have my cheek on a tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and whatever happened, we, we were all kids. Remember when you rolled down the hill in the grass? I think we should bring that back. <laughs> for, for adults? <laughs> for everyone. For everyone. For everyone. Emily? Emily, Emily, you want to say something? Um, another thing is to work with clay or food. Um, yeah. yeah, that's very much a sensory thing. Um, clay has got so many uh, different properties and, and to try and get it to work with you um, to do like what you think you want to make the form and your hands and the clay itself is a, it's a very different experience. It's like it has its own way of moving in a way and your hands have to be quite um I think quite light in touch um to kind of feel that that clay obviously baking you know working with making bread and things not that I do that but I think you know working with the dough is also um you know for a lot of people that's very therapeutic is to work with clay and 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 baking a friend of mine she's an art therapist and she told me about this clay therapy she doesn't even recommend it to not everybody because it really can trigger something it reminds us a lot of being um, a very young child on our mother's um, chest and when we were breastfeeding uh, little ones always try to connect with the moms with the little hands. And she told me that uh, in therapy, in art therapy, they use clear, uh, clay very consciously because it brings back very early memories. Oh. And I found this very astonishing because I love doing something with my hand. I love baking and dough kneading, kneading. but um, I never thought of this like the connection to your to your mother, the first connections with your small hands when you were breastfed or whatever hold in in your in their arms. It's also when you go for walks um, in the forest or in the you know in the in in the field is to pick uh, pick the flowers or pick the stems and how you know often if I walk I, I walk and I fiddle with a something you know it's a, a grass stem or, or a bit of a twig and while I'm walking and I find that quite relaxing actually as well it's that fiddle with something that you've picked up along the way mm. yeah. mm -hmm. Half. hi I loved what um the lady before said in the blue check shirt about um the clay and the dough I don't like dough I find it tedious I find it artificial. However, the clay, I went attended a clay workshop. I found it incredibly therapeutic, having water and clay and molding into something, the contact between the, the clay and your hands. I just found it incredibly just relaxing and free flowing, the connection between the palms of your hands and the clay. But with dough, I don't like it kneading. We make bread from that. I just do not like it. But Clay feels to you so much natural. I don't know whether it's the... And then the connection to the mother's breast. I've had a turbulent relationship with my mother and it didn't trigger nothing. If anything, maybe it's just some form of catharsis, some kind of release. So yeah, I can see Michaela laughing. Um, but I, I really like what she said. It is incredibly profound. But um, anyway, on another note, regarding touch, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I like um, dandelions. Dandelions, the plant, especially when you blow them and they disperse in the air. I love that. And also touching them against your skin, you can't because they just fr fritter away. They just fritter away. I just love them. They're so beautiful and fragile. And to touch it, it's just, 
Well, you can touch a green stem, but the actual plant is just so frail. And then I love walking on the sandstones in our back garden. We've got sandstone pavement, so I love walking on them. It's long faded. But um, like you said, I for I don't know, for some bizarre reason, I was walking today in the garden in my bare feet because I felt hot. I didn't know this workshop would have that correlation. But then I made the connection with how concrete is hard and even, and it feels more man-made sandstone, even though there are only square, squares constructed and then plotted together in the garden. It just felt so nat uh, natural. I think the fact that they're made out of sand, I love that connotation. Um, I also love grass. Barefoot in the grass in the local park. It's so soft and squishy. And you see little flowers growing in there, daisies and buttercups, and it just fills me a joy. But um, today in the garden, while I'm watching um, plants grow, I keep on coming across white dry snails. You know, the, 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 I think they've died. The, the little snails, they originally brown and they've dried out and you just got this white crustian um, husk or shell left and you're looking at them. They just look so beautiful and ornamental because I know you can make jewelry from them. But they look so chalky and smooth and they look like they're preserved with another time in history or even epoch all together. When they're alive, they're brown and squishy and ew, slimy. But when it's dried out in the sun heat, they just look something else altogether. And we also have a water tap in the garden, which I use to hose the plants with. I love how the water is pure, clear and unfiltrated. Um, I'm tempted to drink from it, but I couldn't because I'm fasting. But then I put my hands and it's just so relaxing and releasing again. I love the connection to nature and hands. And I know we're doing, uh, we're talking about touch. I just love the beauty of that. It's, it's things we take for granted. It's the simple things that are in life, like nature itself, are very um, pleasure bring you a lot of pleasure and then uh, if you sit if you sit directly in the garden the sun is just directly on you and you feel like the heat itself but then if you get up to move you'll find out the air is humid the air remains consistent and still even though you're moving the air is just still you know it's just one consistent temperature and it's just very sticky and clammy I suppose it'll release some pollen from the nearby trees and hedges yeah Thank you very much, Par. I Thank think you. We need to, to move on, so many great ideas. Yeah, <laughs> the do list. We need to race through the senses now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so the taste, taste, of course, uh, is one of our favorite things because it goes with smell and taste and and whatever happens in your mouth. And when you when you have something in your mouth, you you really feel it and it becomes part of you. So uh, what we were suggesting is having a blind taste of herbs and spices, you know, just take a few little pots and put the spices in and mix them around and blindfold yourself or promise you don't look and, and try it and try to recognize it. it. Sometimes it's much harder than you think. Uh, if you don't see the color, uh, it it's it's very difficult sometimes and and some dried spices have absolutely different uh tastes than uh the fresh one or the cooked ones are completely different from the raw ones and i think it's it, it it's quite quite interesting how about you sonia yeah this was one of my first experiences in kindergarten we had a blindfold blind tasting of some uh, some herbs and i think they gave us also coffee coffee <laughs> powder and i introduced this to my kids and they loved it a lot even if they are now a bit older they love um, finding tricks um, with us things we won't recognize or things uh, they are sure about the sister doesn't like or whatever. So it's just a kind of a family game sometimes. And it's also interesting to see uh, where this um, um, taste is uh, coming to, to glory. In the part, which part of the tongue is affected the most? This struck me when I first thought about it. I also, okay, it's in my mouth, I can feel it. But when you take care, carefully listening to your body, and try to localize where it is. It's very interesting if you do it each, each on your on their own, and then drink a sip of water to clear it, and then try it again. I find it really, yeah, astonishing. And also, you don't always only taste with your tongue. You also t taste with the inside of your mouth and the gums, and where 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 is it happening? Yeah, exactly. Like I think, oh, Sophie or Emily first, whoever. 
<laughs> so there's no one. So Emily, please. <laughs> yes. I once, uh, when I lived in London, I went to a restaurant that was called, oh, some, oh, I can't remember what it was called, but it was a restaurant where you had to dine in complete darkness. And it was the most incredible experience. I mean, utter darkness. There was not a single bit of light. And it, we were served by blind waiters and waitresses. And it was incredible. We, it, you saw absolutely no light at all. And when you taste the food, your brain keeps trying to tell you what it is, but it cannot recognize what it is. So our brains affect so much the taste of our food. Um, and um, yeah, it was this constant fight with like, just taste the food and not let your brain tell you what the food is. It's trying to recognize it. So it was quite interesting to like calm the brain down and just try and just taste it for the taste, not for what it is, but just for the taste and the experience of that in your mouth. So that's it's one biomimicry principle to quiet our cleverness. That's a very good example for that. Yeah. So Sophie, you want to go next? It is quite amazing, Emily. <laughs> I was going to say exactly the same. I had an experience in Paris about the restaurant in the dark. And the same as you just said, that um, your brain tries to definitely want to put the name on what you're eating and you're all the time wrong anyway, because, because the taste without, without the sight is, is, is not connecting. So even though you try to figure this out, you don't. And I thought as well, it was an amazing experience. What I can add to what you said is um, additionally, we were on a table with other people that we didn't know. Uh, we didn't even see who was getting into the room uh, and where we were sitting down. So we even tried to figure out uh, the, 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 um, the, the job of each person, just hearing the voice. Oh, okay, you have that voice. So it feels like you could be, I don't know, working in an office or being a lawyer and even that went totally wrong i mean <laughs> um so it's quite amazing when you just have one sense and all the other ones are more or less blocked that we see that um what we believe is totally wrong we really need all our senses or maybe we don't but we are so used to use all our senses together that when we have only one or two left we, we, we can't use them right because we even tried that day on, tab on the table to touch, you know, the food or the people to try to figure out, okay, who are you or what, what is it? What is in my plate? And even like this, you, you were wrong. So, yes, I just, I, I, as I said, it was amazing that you were talking about this. It was the same experience I wanted to share. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> So then maybe uh, let's um, come to our last sense. It's smell. I think they are all related to each other. We all know it from smelling flowers, herbs, mushrooms. Also how, how nice nature smells and how awful non-natural smells can be. If you are in an over-perfumed household or guest toilet or whatever. And yeah, I don't have many experiences um, that um, that might be new. I only want to add that I really like the smell of um, fresh uh, young mushrooms in the forest, and I sometimes also knee down on the on the on the on the on the floor, on the soil because um, it's delicious. This um, this um, soil. After the, because it usually rains before mushrooms are coming out. And I really like this lowering change of perspective, kneeling, kneeling down and, and uh, uh, smelling these fresh mushrooms and, and touching the needles around it. So it there comes together some of the senses I really admire or uh, really like to explore because I think a forest is so 
multidimensional dimensional and um maybe the smelling of mushrooms brings me back to my childhood because i used to go to the forest with my grandfather and he knew all the good ones and all the bad ones so that i not ever not end up uh, picking the wrong ones and um it felt very it feels very homely to me being in a forest and even when i was a kid i was not afraid of being in a forest Yeah, I, I really enjoy the sense of smell. Uh, and uh, it, it, I think it's the most primal of our senses. It really brings, you know, the long memories, the hidden memories as well. And and it is a sense that we take for granted. But remember when you have a stuffed nose and you go to a restaurant and nothing tastes like it should, you know, and you're like, it's impossible. You drink coffee when you're the stuffed nose with a cold. Like, I hope life comes back to having smell because this is not enjoyable. <laughs> so I, I, I was thinking of drawing a smell map, maybe even in your house. You know, what do you smell? Do you see like smell detergent do you smell your cat's litter probably if you have a cat that does its stuff inside do you smell your fresh flowers amorous with that you have next to your window do you smell what comes in from outside if you live in a city do you smell the the fumes from the tank and the gas uh, from outside or in your kitchen when you cook and make a smell map at different times of day I think would be very interesting or or different seasons probably doesn't smell the same summer and winter mm. so yeah I think that's that's on my list you can smell snow and it's completely different to a summer evening yeah that crispness that you can smell in the air when you know it's gonna snow yeah it's really really cool or or the the heat on on stones as well the dust the yeah, I really enjoy uh, the sense of smell. Does any one of you have very quickly because we're almost done five minutes and we still have a challenge we want to uh, give to you. So if somebody has a very cool experience to do with smell. Parv? Hi, I'll be very brief. I went to, um, I went to a church school and I always, always remember the smell of the teachers of Ole, Ole the face cream, pink tub. And then I also went to mosque in the afternoons and they also had the same smell. And I was sitting, sitting there thinking, oh my days. And my mother had the same smell. Only when I look back, did I make the three connections? School teachers, mosque teachers, mother. And then I obviously use it and explains why they look so young. But um, it's very powerful. The memories, like someone said, they trigger is incredibly powerful. And lavender. Very young girl, I remember the smell of lavender going to a school museum, and that scent has never left me, and I hate it. Lavender. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much. So maybe, Sonia, you want to quickly race through the core routines and present us with a challenge that we would like to propose to you for this summer. Yeah, I don't, we want to propose some core routines. I am... Um, it's easier to, to do this when you have a sit spot, a spot you you um, sit there frequently. Maybe you want to do it on a daily basis. Uh, for sure, it should be out in nature, but it could be your backyard, the same as uh, a, a spot you can easily reach. It should be really in your distance because you should go there, should be able to go there for the next uh, few weeks. We invite you to think of a natural of the day or a fact or a species of the day that you might have discovered recently when you sit together in the evening or talk to friends on the phone or chat with um, people on the internet uh, you can share stories of the day and also can collect stories of the day if we are connected and maybe do it together with a friend and what um we already discussed in this last 50 minutes is that um, I believe that uh, we have much more senses and expanding our senses through observation and mindfulness could give uh, us with a list that might be much longer than uh, these five senses we usually turn to. And I just wanted to quickly share, I recently came across the book Coyote's Guide, 
and there is a list in it. It's my preferred part of the book. I think it's more than 20 more senses. It's the sense of season, it's the sense of proximity, it's um, the sense of, uh, of play. It's also the sense of temperature, the sense of um, the sense of it is time to hibernate and uh, some things like that. And maybe we could um, add some more senses to this list. And um, now we come to the challenge. It's the next slide, Michaela. So yeah. We, yeah, we really want to invite you to do this 24, uh, 21 days in a row. This reconnection challenge, just, just do it for you. Just do it for your own, but share it if you like it. Keep a journal, book, a drawing, a white a writing, something like that. Maybe a bit smaller or a block. Take your sit spot out there and bring your sketchbook, the spiral and your pencils. And really do not want to be perfect. Just catch what you are experiencing and take your favorite um, sense or ability to, to do so. Draw or write a collage, or record it on the phone or or a podcast about it, but collect it and do it consciously for 21 days in a row. This is um, on purpose, this 21 days, because after 21 days, our brain is able to rewire some, some areas and new brain patterns can be found. So it's much more likely that you will continue with this new practice if you do it at least 21 days. And yeah, it might be also inspiring for a friend or you could exchange with uh, family members and share experiences also with us. And uh, Michaela, you wanna do the part about the LinkedIn, the reconnection? Yeah, so if you take up the challenge or only a part of the challenge, uh, please share with us uh, your picture of the day, your journaling of the day, maybe your quote of the day that you collected about nature. Uh, I, I just bought a book about haikus, one haiku a day. And, and sometimes they really resonate. Sometimes they don't. Uh, the ones that I like, I, I, I write them down. I can I, I could put them on LinkedIn on the Biomimicry Switzerland page, uh, send them to us. And um, I think it'd be very nice to have like a mix of all of our experiences of this summer. I'll try to take, take a picture, nature pick of the day. Every day with my phone, I will take a picture of something that is natural. And at the end, I'll, I'll try to make like a mosaic out of it. And that's going to be the mosaic of my summer. And I think this, uh, I'd love to share this mosaic with you uh, on LinkedIn, on Facebook uh, with Biomimicry Switzerland. Or um, do we have an e email address? Oh, you send it to me. I'll just give you my email address. And we, we can maybe do something together uh, at, at the end of the summer and see who did what and what what it what people liked. Mm -hmm. So send me your pics and your poems and your haikus and your collages and and your herbs and spices and everything in between. <laughs> I'll keep good care of it. So maybe you want to say goodbye to everyone, my dear Sonia, because... Yeah, just, just a few uh, sentences at the end. We want to keep this webinar for free. We, we are happy if you share this idea that we do these webinars regularly, that you tell your friends. Um, we also accept donations if you are capable of doing this, but... Um, we also want to have new ideas. If you think of topics you are interested in or speakers you might be interested in, just share it with you, uh, with us, and we will try to make it possible in the following months. Uh, we also invite you, if you want to speak to us, with us about a topic you are a specialist on, we really like to, to do this all interdisciplinary and mix and mingle all the different people around the different topics. And yeah, we will be back in September with the next webinar. And during our summer break, we will contribute to our challenge. For me, it's this time it's sketching. That's the reason why all these blocks are laying around here because it's, it's an underdeveloped skill and I have to <laughs> develop it a bit. So I, I go for that. <laughs> I really need to learn how to draw. That's... Yeah, we will do that. We will do that. Maybe not in this life. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So thanking, uh, thanks for joining us and thanks for your time and uh, staying this hour with spending this hour with us. And what is the word again for this summer sonnenwende? You you say the goodbye for summer this summer. Summer, summer solstice. Summer solstice. Yes. Yes. Winter solstice for Emily. Uh, <laughs> enjoy your winter solstice. Thanks very much for sharing you. uh, all your stories, all your tips. Well, it's been great. It's like a fireside chat in the summer. So, uh, fantastic. <laughs> Thank Thanks very much. Thank you. See you soon. See you soon. Bye.